Part 5 We seem to have got so beautifully used to it, Trevor remarked more than a month later to Jane. We seem to have lived into it and through it so, and to have suffered and surmounted the worst, that upon my word I scarce see what's the matter now, or what, that's very dreadful, it's doing or has done for us. We have in the interest of her, no, he had gone on, slowly pacing and revolving things according to his wont, while the sharer of his life, tea being over and the service removed, reclined on a sofa, perfectly still and with her eyes rigidly closed. We have lost that, and I agree that it was great. I mean the interest of the number of ideas the situation presented us with. That has dropped, by our own act, evidently. We must have simply settled the case a month ago in such a way as that we shall have no more acquaintance with it, by which I mean no more of the fun of it. I, for one, confess I miss the fun, put it only at the fun of our having had to wriggle so with shame, or call it, if you like, to live so under arms against prying questions and the too easy exposure of our false explanations, which only proves, however, that, as I say, the worst that has happened to us appears to be that we are going to find life tame again, as tame as it was before ever Mora came into it so immensely to enrich and agitate it. She has gone out of it, obviously, to leave it flat and forlorn, tireless, after having had for so many months the highest flavour. If by her not thanking you, even though she declined, by her not acknowledging in any way your, as I admit, altogether munificent offer, it seems indicated that we should hold her to have definitely enrolled herself in the deplorable flaunting class. We must at least recognize that she doesn't flaunt at us, at whomsoever else she may, and that she has, in short, cut us as neatly and effectively as in the event of her conclusive, her supreme costumacy, we could have aspired to cut her. Never was a scandal therefore less scandalous, nor naturally a disappointment, that is, to our good friends, whose resentment of this holy calm, this absence of any echo of any convulsion, of any sensation of any kind to be picked up, strikes me as ushering in the only form of ostracism, our dissimulated taint, our connection with lurid facts that might have gone on making us rather eminently worth while, will have earned for us. But aren't custom and use breaking us into the sense even of that anticlimax, and preparing us for future years of wistful, rueful, regretful thought of the time when everything was nice and dreadful? Mrs. Traffel's posture was now more and more certainly this recumbent sightless stillness, which she appeared to have resorted to at first, after the launching, that is, of her ultimatum to Mr. Puddock, as a sign of the intensity with which she awaited results. There had been no results, alas. There were none from week to week. Never was the strain of suspense less gratefully crowned, with a drawback, moreover, that they could settle to nothing, not even to the alternative, that of the cold consciousness of slighted magnanimity, in which Jane had assumed beforehand that she should find her last support. Her husband circled about her couch with his eternal dim whistle at a discreet distance, as certain as if he turned to catch her in the act that when his back was presented in thoughtful retreat her tightened eyes opened to rest on it with peculiar sharpness. She waited for the proof that she had intervened to advantage, the advantage of Mora's social future, and she had to put up with Sidney's watching her wait. So he, on his side, lived under her tacit criticism of that attention, and had they asked themselves, the comfortless pair, as it's in fact scarcely conceivable that they didn't, what it would practically have cost them to receive their niece without questions, they might well have judged their present ordeal much the dearer. When Sidney had felt his wife glare at him undetectedly for a fortnight, he knew at least what it meant— and if she had signified how much he might have to pay for it, should he presume again to see Mora alone, she was now, in their community of a quietitude that had fairly soured on their hands, getting ready to quarrel with him for his poverty of imagination about that menace. Absolutely, the conviction grew for him, she would have liked him better to do something, even something inconsiderate of her to the point of rudeness, than simply parade there in the deference that left her to languish. The fault of this conspicuous propriety, which gave on her nerves, was that it did nothing to refresh their decidedly rather starved sense of their case, so that Traffel was frankly merciless, frankly, that is, for himself, in his application of her warning. There was nothing he would indeed have liked better than to call on Mora, quite as who should say, in the friendly way to which her own last visit at Wimbledon had set so bright an example. At the same time, though he revelled in his acute reflection, as the partner of his home, I have only to go and then come back with some new fact, Ella Dreyfus, in order to make her sit up in a false flare that will break our insufferable spell. He was yet determined that that flare, certain to take place sooner or later, should precede his act, so large a license might he then obviously build upon it. His excursions to town were on occasion, even in truth, not other than perverse, determined, that is, he was well aware, by their calculated effect on Jane, who could imagine in his absence each time that he might be following something up, 
an expression that had, in fact, once slipped from her, might be having the gumption, in other words, to glean a few straws for their naked nest. Imagine it, yes, only to feel herself fall back again on the mere thorns of consistency. It wasn't, nevertheless, that he took all his exercise to this super-subtle tune. The state of his own nerves treated him at moments to larger and looser exactions, which is why, though poor Jane's sofa still remained his centre of radiation, the span of his unrest sometimes embraced half London. He had never been on such fidgety terms with his club, which he could neither not resort to from his suburb with an unnatural frequency, nor make, in the event, any coherent use of, so that his suspicion of his not remarkably carrying it off there was confirmed to him, disconcertingly, one morning, when his dash townward had been particularly wild, by the free address of a fellow member prone always to overdoing fellowship, and who had doubtless for some time amusedly watched his vague gyrations. "'I say, Treff, old man, what in the world this time have you got on?' It had never been anything but easier to answer the ass, and was easier than ever now. On? You don't suppose I addressed to you to come and meet you? Yet the effect of the nasty little mirror of his unsatisfied state so flashed before him as to make him a fresh wonder wide, if wide half the stretch of Trafalgar Square could be called. He turned into the natural gallery, where the great masters were tantalizing more by their indifference than by any offer of company, and where he could take up again his personal tradition of a lawless range. One couldn't be a raffine at Wimbledon, no, not with any comfort, but he quite liked to think how he had never been anything less in the great museum, distinguished as he thus was from those who gaped impartially and did the place by schools. His sympathies were special and far-scattered, just as the places of pilgrimage he most fondly reverted to were corners unnoted and cold, where the idol in the numbered shrine set apart to await him. So he found himself at the end of five minutes in one of the smaller, one of the Dutch rooms, in a temple bare and very fact at that moment, save for just one other of the faithful. This was a young person, visibly young, from the threshold of the place, in spite of the back presented for an instant, while a small picture before which she had stopped continued to hold her, but who turned at the sound of his entering footfall, and who then again, as by an alertness in this movement, engaged his eyes, with which it was remarkable given to Treffle to feel himself recognised even almost to immediate, to artless extravagance of display, two things— the first, that his fellow votary in the unprofaned place, and at the odd morning hour, was none other than their invincible Mora, surprised by this extraordinary fluke in her invincibility, and the second, oh, his certainty of that, that she was expecting to be joined there by no such pale fellow-adventurer as her wholesome uncle. It amazed him, as it also annoyed him on the spot, that his heart for thirty seconds should be standing almost still. But he wasn't to be able afterwards to blink it that he had at once quite gone to pieces, and a slight subsequent success in recovering himself to the contrary notwithstanding. Their happening thus to meet was obviously a wonder. It made him feel unprepared. But what especially did the business for him, he subsequently reflected, was again a renewed degree, and for that matter the developed kind, of importance that the girl's beauty gave her. Dear Jane at home, as he knew, and as Maura herself probably if that matter did, was sunk in the conviction that she was leading a life but whatever she was doing, it was clearly the particular thing she might best be occupied with. How else could anything be better for a lovely creature than thus to glow from month to month in loveliness, so that she was able to stand there before him, with no more felt inconvenience than the sense of the mere tribute of his eyes could promptly rectify? They had ministered positively to his weakness, the justice he did on the spot to the rare shade of human felicity, human impunity, human sublimity, call it what one would, surely dwelling in such a consciousness. How could a girl have to think long, have to think more than three-quarters of a second, under any stress whatever of anything in the world, but that her presence was an absolute incomparable value? The prodigious thing, too, was that it had had in the past, and the comparatively recent past, that one easily recalled, to content itself with counting twenty times less, a proof precisely that any condition so determined could only as a matter of course have been odious, and, at the least, outrageous to her. Goodness knew with what glare of graceless intention this rush of recognition was accompanied in poor Treffle, who was later on to ask himself whether he had showed to less advantage in the freshness of his commotion, or in the promptly enough subsequent rage of his coolness. The commotion, in any case, had doubtless appeared more to paralyse and to agitate him, since Mora had had time to come nearer, while he showed for helplessly planted. He hadn't even at the moment been proud of his presence of mind, but it was, as they afterwards haunted his ear, that the echoes of what he had first found to say were most odious to him. "'I am glad to take your being here for a sign that you have not lost your interest in art. That might have passed if he hadn't so almost feverishly floundered on. I hope you keep up your painting, uh, with such a position as you must be in for serious work. I always thought, you know, that you'd do something if you'd stick to it. 
In fact, we quite miss your not bringing us something to admire, as you sometimes did. We haven't, you see, much of an art atmosphere now. I'm glad you're fond of the Dutch. That little Metsu over there, uh, that I think you were looking at, is a pet thing of my own. And if my living to do something myself hadn't been the most idiotic of dreams, something in his line, uh, though, of course, a thousand miles behind him, uh, was what I should have tried to go in for. Uh, you see, at any rate, where, missing, as I say, our art atmosphere, I have come to find one. But such a bad place, certainly. So he had hysterically gabbled, especially at this quiet hour, as I see you yourself quite feel. I just turned in, the <laughs> dust his courage. I hope, however, it hasn't that effect on you. He knew himself to grin with the last awkwardness, making it worse the next instant by the gay insinuation. I'm bound to say, it isn't how you look, discourage. It reeked for him with reference even while he said it, for the truth was but too intensely, too insidiously somehow, that her confidence implied that it in fact bravely betrayed grounds. He was to appreciate this wild waver in retrospect as positive dizziness in a narrow pass, the abyss being naturally on either side, that abyss of the fact of the girl's existence which he must thus have seemed to rush into, a smirking and disgusting tribute to them through his excessive wish to show how clear he kept of them. The terrible, the fatal truth was that she had made everything too difficult, or that this, at any rate, was how she enjoyed the exquisite privilege of affecting him. She watched him, she saw him splash to keep from sinking, with a pitiless, cold, sweet irony, she gave him rope as a siren on a headland might have been amused at some bather beyond his depth and unable to swim. Yet it was all the fault his want of ease was, of the real extravagance of his idea of not letting her spy even the tip of the tail of any freedom with her, thanks to which fatality she had indeed the game in her own hands. She exhaled a distinction. It glanced out of every shade of selection, every turn of expression in her dress, though she had always, for that matter, had the genius of felicity there, which was practically the new fact all Wimbledon had been awaiting. And yet so perverse was their relation that to mark at all any special consideration for it was to appear just to make the illusion he was almost forbidding himself. It was hard, his troubled consciousness told him, to be able neither to overlook any effect without brutality, nor to recognise them without impertinence, and he was frankly at the end of his resources by the time he ceased beating the air. Then it was, yes, then it was perfectly, as if she had patiently let him show her each of his ways of making a fool of himself. When she still said nothing a moment— and yet still managed to keep him ridiculous, as if a certainty on that head. It was true that when she at last spoke, she swept everything away. "'It's a great chance my meeting you, for what you so kindly think of me.' She brought that out as if he had been uttering mere vain sounds, to which he preferred the comparative seriousness of the human, or at least of the mature state, and her unexpectedness it was that thus a little stiffened him up. "'What I think of you? How do you know what I think?' She dimly and charmingly smiled at him, for it wasn't really that she was harsh. She was but infinitely remote, the siren on her head land dazzlingly in view, yet communicating precisely over such an abyss. "'Because it's so much more, you mean, than you know yourself. If you don't know yourself, if you know as little as, I confess, you strike me as doing.' She, however, at once went on. "'I'm more sorry for you than anything else, even though the best, I dare say. It must seem odd to you to hear me so patronising.' It was borne in upon him thus, that she would now make no difference to his honour, to that of his so much more emancipated spirit, at least, between her aunt and her uncle, so much would the poor uncle enjoy for his pains. He should stand or fall with fatal Jane, for at this point he was already sure Jane had been fatal. It was, in fact, with fatal Jane tied as a millstone round his neck, that he at present knew himself sinking. You try to make grabs at some idea, but the simplest never occurs to you. What do you call the simplest mourner? He had this heard himself whine. Why am I being simply a good girl? You gape at it. He was trying exactly not to. As if it passed your belief. That is really all the while, to my own sense, what has been the matter with me. I mean, you see, a good creature, wanting to live at peace. Everything, however, occurs to you but that, and in spite of my trying to show you. You never understood, she said, with her sad, quiet lucidity, what I came to see you for two months ago. He was on the point of breaking in to declare that the reach of his intelligence at the juncture of which he spoke had been quite beyond expression, but he checked himself in time, as it would strike her, but as a vague effort to make exactly the distinction that she held cheap. No, he wouldn't give Jane away now. He'd suffer anything instead. The taste of what he should have to suffer was already there on his lips. It came over him, to the strangest effect of desolation, of desolation made certain, that they should have lost Mona for ever and that this present scant passage must count for them as her form of rapture. Jane had treated her the other day, treated her, that is, to Walter Puddick, who would have been, when all was said, a faithful agent, to their form, their form save on the condition attached, much to a stiffer one, no doubt, 
so that he was actually having an extraordinary girl's answer. What they thought of her was that she was Walter Puddock's mistress, the only difference between them being that whereas her aunt fixed the character upon her by the act of tying a neatly inscribed luggage tag to a bandbox, he himself flourished about with his tag in his hand, and a portentous grin for what he could do with it if he would. She brushed aside a like, however, vulgar label and bewildered formula. She but took Jane's message as involving an insult, and if she treated him as a participant with any shade of humanity, it was indeed that she was the good creature for whom she had a moment ago claimed credit. Even under the sense of so supreme a pang, poor Trevel could value his actual, his living, his wonderful impression, rarest treasure of sense, as what the whole history would most have left with him. It was all he should have of her in the future, the mere memory of these dreadful minutes in so noble a place, minutes that were shining easy grace on her part and helpless humiliation on his. Wherefore, tragically but instinctively, he gathered in, as for preservation, every grain of the experience. That was it. They had given her, without intending it, still wider wings of freedom, the clue, the excuse, the pretext, whatever she might call it, for shaking off any bond that had still incommoded her. She was spreading her wings, that was what he saw, as if she hovered, rising and rising, like an angel in a vision. It was the picture that he might, if he chose, or mightn't, make Jane on his return sit up to. Truths, these, that for our interest in them, or for our grasp on them, press on us in succession, but that within his breast were quick and simultaneous so that it was virtually without a weight he heard her go on. Do try. That's really all I want to say, to keep hold of my husband. Your husband? He did gape. She had the oddest charming surprise, her nearest approach to familiarity. Walter Puddick, did you know I married? And then, as for the life of me, still couldn't but stare. Hasn't he told you? Told us? Why, we haven't seen him. Since the day you— since the day you so put the case to him. Oh, I should have supposed. She would have supposed, obviously, that he might in some way have communicated the fact, but she clearly hadn't so much as assured herself of it. Then there exactly he is. He doesn't seem, poor dear, to know what to do. And she had on his behalf, apparently, a moment of beautiful anxious, yet at the same time detached and all momentary thought. That's just then what I mean. My dear child, Treffle gasped, what on earth do you mean? Well— and she dropped for an instant, comparatively to within his reach. "'That it's where you can come in, where, in fact, as I say, I quite wish you would.' All his wandering attention for a moment hung upon her. "'Do you ask me, Mora, to do something for you?' "'Yes. And it was as if no good creature had ever been so beautiful, nor any beautiful creature ever so good. To make him your care, to see that he does get it.' "'Get it?' Treffel blankly echoed. "'Why, what you promised him?' My aunt's money. He felt his countenance in exhibition. She promised it, Maura, to you. If I married him, yes, because I wasn't fit for her to speak to till I should. But if I'm now proudly Mrs. Puddick, he had already, however, as an immense revulsion, a long jump taken her up. You are, you are? He gasped at the difference it made, and in which then, immensely, they seemed to recover her, before all men, and the registrar. The registrar? He again echoed so that, with another turn of her humour, it made her lift her eyebrows at him. "'You mean it doesn't hold if that's the way?' "'It holds more, I suppose, anyway. That makes a real marriage. It is,' he hopefully smiled. "'Real? Could anything be more real?' she asked. "'Than to have become such a thing? Walter Puddock's wife?' He kept his eyes on her pleadingly. "'Surely, Maura, it's a good thing, clever and charming as he is.' Now that Maura had succeeded, his instinct of a sudden was to back her up. Mrs. Puddock's face, and the fact was it was strange, in the light of her actual aspect, to think of her and name her so, showed her as ready a disposition. If he's as much as that, then why were you so shocked by my relations with him? He panted, he cast about. Why, we, we didn't doubt of his distinction, of what it was at any rate likely to become. You only doubted of mine, she asked with her harder look. He threw out helpless arms. He dropped them while he gazed at her. It doesn't seem to me possible any one can ever have questioned your gift for doing things in your own way. And if you're now married, he added, with his return of tentative resumption and his strange smile, your own way opens out for you, doesn't it? Has never yet. Her eyes on this held him a moment, and he couldn't have said now what was in them. I think it does. I'm seeing, she said. I shall see. Only, she hesitated but for an instant, for that it's necessary you shall look after him. 
They stood there face to face on it. During a pause that lighted by her radiance gave him time to take from her somehow larger and stranger things than either might at all intelligibly or happily have named. "'Do you ask it of me?' "'I ask it of you,' said Mrs. Paddock after a wait, that affected him as giving his contribution to her enjoyment of that title as part of her reason. He held out, however, contribution or no contribution, another moment. "'Do you beg me very hard?' Once more she hung far, but she let him have it. "'I beg you very hard.' It made him turn pale. "'Thank you,' he said, and it was as if now he didn't care what monstrous bargain he passed with her, which was fortunate for that matter, since, when she next spoke, the quantity struck him as looming large. "'I want to be free.' "'How can you not?' said Sidney Treffle, feeling to the most extraordinary tune, at one and the same time both sublime and base, and quite vague as well as indifferent, as to which character prevailed. But I don't want him, you see, to suffer. Besides the opportunity that this spread before him, he could have blessed her, could have embraced her, for, you see, well, I promise you he shan't suffer if I can help it. Thank you, she said, in a manner that gave him, if possible, even greater pleasure yet, showing him as it did, after all, what an honest man she thought him. He, even at that point, had his apprehension of the queerness of the engagement, that as an honest man he was taking, the engagement, since she so wanted to be free, to relieve her, so far as he devoutly might, of any care hampering this ideal. But his perception took a tremendous bound, as he noticed that that interview had within a moment become exposed to observation. A reflected light in Morris's face, caught from the quarter behind him, suddenly so advised him, and caused him to turn, with the consequence of his seeing a gentleman in the doorway by which he had entered. A gentleman in the act of replacing the hat raised to salute Mrs. Puddick, and with an accompanying smile still vivid in a clear, fresh, well-featured face. Everything took for Sidney Treffle a sharper sense of this apparition, and he had, even while the fact of the nature of his young friend's business there, the keeping of an agreeable appointment in discreet conditions, stood out for him again as in its odd insolence of serenity and success, the consciousness that whatever his young friend was doing, whatever she was up to, he was now quite as much in the act of backing her as the gentleman in the doorway, a slightly mature but strikingly well-dressed, a pleasantly masterful-looking gentleman, a haunter of the best society, one could be sure, was waiting for him to go. Mora herself promptly had that apprehension, and conveyed it to him the next thing, in words that amounted, with their sweet, conclusive look, to a decent dismissal. "'Here's what's of real importance to me,' she seemed to say. "'So, though I count on you, I needn't keep you longer.' But she took time, in fact, just to revert. "'I've asked him to go to you, and he will, I'm sure, he will, by which you'll have your chance, don't fear. Good-bye.' She spoke as if this chance were what he would now at once be most yearning for, and thus it was that while he stayed but long enough to let his eyes move again to the new, the impatient, and distinctly smart, yes, unmistakably this time, not a bit bohemian candidate for her attention, and then let them come back to herself, as for some grasp of the question of a relation already so developed, there might have hung itself up there the prospect of an infinite future responsibility about Walter Puddock, if only as a make-weight, perhaps the extinction of everything else. When he had turned his back and began humbly to shuffle, as it seemed to him, through a succession of shining rooms where the walls bristled with eyes that watched him for mockery, his sense was of having seen the last of Mora, as completely as if she had just seated herself in the car of a rising balloon that would never descend again to earth.' 